Well, hello, this is John Reed, Digitonomica. I'm in an unfamiliar location, Philadelphia. Don't get that very much, but I got one of my favorite usual suspects, Brian Summer. How are we doing? I'm doing just fine. Um, uh, yes, we are both here in Philadelphia at the Sofitel, and uh, hopefully this room will stay quiet while we're doing this. There will be a bunch of uh, hotel people coming in or out. Indeed, this is looming as a breakdown area, and breakdowns and podcasts don't go together. But we are gathered here, Brian, because before you and I completely go off into ventures on jets and tarmacs, we want to make sense of what happened at the Unit 4 Analyst Day. Unit 4 is a vendor that has brought a lot of interesting thinking to cloud ERP over the last number of years, but we haven't had an analyst day in a few years. So here we are to make sense of it. One really cool thing that I want to give Unit 4 props for right away is there was no NDA content this entire day, which is incredibly rare. So you and I don't have to spend any time thinking about, oh crap, can I say this in the podcast? And we can bring this insights to you, the people. So let's try to get some trenchant insights, shall we, Brian? Uh, trenchant? Yeah. Man, you're reaching for the hey, thesaurus already. I mean, this is good Well, it's be... the buzzword generator, right? Well, we'll talk about that at the end. Yeah, we'll get to that. In yeah. The... So what are your impressions? You've been tracking this company for a long time. How would you describe like why audience should pay attention to this company? What are they about? Well... Uh, first of all, uh, the Agresso products have been around for eons. Uh, I knew them when they had a big presence in the Netherlands, of all places. They also were related for a time with Coda software, and um, and piece of Coda became Financial Force, which then became Certinia. I mean, you know, so I guess what I'm establishing is I'm doing one of those uh, Dr. Um, Henry Gates uh, genealogy TV shows here. You know, what are your software roots? Uh, but they've been around a while. And Aggressive was interesting because it was, a, um, it was a solution that allowed all kinds of dynamic flexibility that you could completely recast your financials, you know, just by uh, electing to do so. And it could rebuild stuff for you. It was pretty slick. Anyway, the, through some ownership changes, whatever, and leadership changes, the company has has uh, altered uh, quite a bit over the years. They've got an ERP suite, and they sell predominantly to four main verticals. Um, and uh, just off the top of my head, I believe there are the uh, professional services, public sector, uh, higher education, and... Nonprofit would be the fourth. Hmm? Nonprofit is and the nonprofits, fourth. And yep. nonprofits, yes. Uh, I can't believe I'm missing that one. But anyway, I'm doing this off the top of my head. Anyway, I liked... Um, uh, they've had uh, long-standing customers in all of those sectors. They sell well in those sectors. That's why they're kind of relevant. And um, we know their CEO, Mike Etling, very well from other companies he's been involved with over the years. Just a couple quick stats, $450 million revenue. I can't remember my notes. I think that might be euros, though. I'm pretty sure from the slide. And 15% uh, growth AR. So, um, but one interesting thing about Unit 4 is for quite some time, they were pushing the self-driving ERP slogan, which at the time appeared a little bit ahead of its time. Now that slogan has been revived for the new Unit 4 missions. And uh, I have some pros and cons with that slogan, but there's interesting stuff there around Etling's comments on RPA. So do you want to talk about that? that was yeah, Mike made a comment about how um, he didn't believe that Vendors should have, uh, or customers should have to buy separate ERP and RPA, robotic process automation tools. And I've kind of liked some of the RPA tools. They've been a, fit, a darling uh, for companies like the insurance industry and the governmental sector. Those are two in particular that really loved RPA. And what it would do is you could set up rules and think of it as almost like switches on a manufacturing line. It would detect something new on an item, and then, boom, it was shunted to one direction or another. And the same thing happens on workflows. You could build in all kinds of controls, governance, and uh, oversight and everything else as transactions are coming through. Mike's correct that these shouldn't be two different products because, frankly, what we know is ERP is just being relegated to becoming a transaction engine for the most part in a storage yep. space for uh, validated process transactions. 
And where we really ought to be going is, uh, well, we need to be thinking that RPA really is one of the earlier big mass rollouts of an artificial intelligence technology. It was machine learning is what it was, and it, it knew how to move stuff around for you, and it improved process efficiency and productivity quite nicely. I want to add to that briefly, which is that um, folks want a little more background on my take on this. Uh, I've written about this on Diginomica recently, but one of the big misconceptions that's driving me crazy about generative AI is this notion, this ludicrous notion that generative AI is going to be good at the kinds of things RPA is good for, therefore RPA is legacy. In fact, that's crap. Um, it doesn't validate with what Gen, Gen AI is good for at all. Gen AI is a probabilistic technology that is really good at engaging users. It's really good at dealing with unstructured data as well as structured data. So there's a lot of cool things you can potentially do, but what it's not going to do is run your enterprise processes. That's not what it's for. It, the way Etling described it in the Unit 4 approach to AI is RP, it's, RPA is the hook. You hook that into your Gen AI. So you can invoke those automations. So all that work they've done on the RPA-based automations puts them in a position to layer the generative AI tooling on top of that. So I think it's a really important point versus just, oh, we're going to replace all our RPA. That's not what people are going to do. So let me give you a, let me give the listeners, I guess, a really good example of the differences. With RPA, you actually go in and you define kind of, it could be ranges, it right. could be numerical values, whatever. It's primarily rules-based. It's rules. Yeah. You're setting up rules and you're also setting up controls. You know, if the invoice exceeds uh, $10,000, it goes to a different workflow approval process. So these are, these are actually great things to have, particularly if you're in accounting, because you want to be able to have your auditor see that you've got these documented controls, processes, and so yep. forth. That's the RPA, RPA side of machine learning and machine processing. The generative stuff, well, where that comes in is, okay, so a transact, some tr uh, anomalous transaction got sent to a review box by RPA, now uh, a user, an end user, has to look at this, and generative AI would be really good in helping this person understand, hey, uh, John, here are the rules we have in this company. So it's stating right. what the rules are. It states what other kind of approvals might be necessary, but could possibly look at things like, hey, uh, this particular vendor always submits invoices between like a hundred dollars and five hundred dollars, and this one's coming in at ten thousand. Are you really sure this is correct? Right. And that's it's serving up context, I guess, to help a user, whereas the RPA is just figuring out right. if you will what's anomalous. And the generative AI solution could also perhaps say recommend a field that isn't normally filled out that needs to be, or it could even offer right. it could offer to send this back to a customer and, and create a, an email template like in, or even if you're confident in it, fire it off. But the point is the technologies work well together, which is like contrary to a lot of the hype that we're hearing right now of like, oh, that's a legacy RPA is like done and gone. It's past technology. Now we're on to generative. It's like, and, and this is what we hear when people are like, oh, we're rebuilding our, our ERP with Gen AI. It's like, why would you do that? Like just use what you have. And then figure out how to make it more "quote unquote" intelligent. So anyway, we've we've gone for, far enough down that path. So uh, I want to talk about something a little controversial that Unit Four is doing with end and maintenance. But before I go there, I did want to mention one thing that I I think they excelled in that I didn't see a lot this fall. This fall, I saw a lot, a whole lot about you have a new AI teammate on your team. You know, it was all about the, your AI teammate or your co-pilot. Mm -hmm. And yes, Unit 4 has an announcement there too, which we'll get to. But I liked how Unit 4 really emphasized the human side of collaboration. And as part of their so-called, part of what they mean by self-driving ERP is so-called headless ERP. So the idea being like, work in the environment you want to. So they had a lot of team-based stuff, which I thought was cool as far as, yeah, you don't have to log into your ERP system to do that. So they had a lot of really good demos, I think, that that showed humans collaborating with each other in the context they're comfortable with without having to like navigate screens and then email your colleague about a question you have about some screen. So anyway, I thought that was cool, but 
Yeah, and for the listeners, they were showing examples where uh, one user is doing everything on her cell phone, and the, uh, the let's call it the expert super user is actually working on some other stuff, uh, some approval thing that was kind of hinky. He's working on it on his uh, laptop, and they're also working through some collaboration stuff. And it's figuring out and find out all this stuff to the point where you don't know where the data, uh, where the um, where the unit for ERPX kind of application is that you're looking at, uh, because it it may be it's the thing feeding the mobile screens and the mobile UX. It's the thing feeding a lot of right. some of the AI kind of stuff. And, and which is really kind of nice because we're finally moving away from those old school fixed command line kind of uh, right. user or tab lines uh, that we're so used to seeing in so many UXs. One of the things we didn't get into today that I would have liked to get into is I still, you know, believe that a lot of the old school super users are going to want their screens and are going to keep wanting to use them. But I think it's such a huge deal with new users in the system and casual users and making it easy for those folks. So you talk a lot about the talent wars. I don't think you can like compete in the talent wars if you're going to ask young professionals to, to navigate old school ERP green screens, you know, and they might as well be green for how easy they are to navigate, right? So. Yeah, since I have, uh, I'm old enough to have kids in the workforce, uh, I get earfuls about how bad old school yeah. uh, screens are, UXs are. And I don't ask for the feedback. They just volunteer it for me. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and I think it's a factor in recruiting and hiring and retention. Anyway, uh, so let's talk about this um, migration deadline, though, because so, so Unifor's go to release is called ERPX, and that's their you know, multi tenant public cloud release. Mm -hmm. And that's where the self driving ERP is sort of built upon if you follow their lingo. 95% of new deals go into ERPX, but they still have a substantial amount of folks. I don't have the exact percentage right in front of me. Um, I think it's what is it, like something like 40%, something. It's, it's, it's less than half, but there's still a good chunk of customers that haven't moved. Um, and they're still on older versions. And Unifor also has a transitional release called CR, but a lot of the older school um, folks are on ERP-7. Uh, so they initiated, I think, last October an announcement that by the end of this calendar year, you got to move. But it's not that simple. They've actually been a little more like flexible in certain ways. But when I first read it, I was like, oh, my God, this is a big mistake. Like, this is the heavy hand of forced marched upgrades. But I think we heard like a more nuanced version of that today. So what are your thoughts? Well, to be clear, the end of life deal kind of comes up closer to the end of 2026. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just that you have to, by the end of, I think, by the beginning of this year, you have to have had some discussion with them, I think, is the right. deal. Yeah, they want some yeah. kind of a signal because... Right. They can't uh, absorb all of the services impact or whatever that might be required if a huge number want to make a change all at once. And it gets worse because with so many of them probably using financial mod modules, a bunch of them might want to convert all of a sudden, uh, all at one time, like into December, 1st of January, because their fiscal and calendar years align. So there's that. But you're right. This was a very, this, this was the furthest away from a heavy-handed approach you could get, but I wouldn't want to mislead a listener into thinking, oh, well, if they extend it to 2026, they'll probably extend it to like 2050 or something. No. Um, there's a finite limit as to how far they're going to do it. And what this really means is you at least need to get over to the CR version of the product yeah, because right. then you'll still be able to get a number of the different uh, technical advancements like. But it still allows customizations and things like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. But if you want to use some of the advanced technologies, those will only be available in uh, the cloud versions of the products. And that includes uh, almost all their AI functionality. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, the there is change afoot and there are not the first vendor that's having to deal with this kind of issue or has, you know, put these kind of end-of-life statements out there. 
Uh, my suggestion is if you're one of the customers, you need to get on the phone and have a conversation with your account exec and find out kind of where are we and what do we have to do? What do I need to budget for so that you're ready for it? And frankly, you have no, I don't know what to tell some folks other than unless you customize the living daylights out of the solution in a way that even, uh, unit four is mother couldn't identify it as one of her own offspring. You need to move if you're ever going to take advantage of some of the new advanced capabilities because they need access to vast amounts of data. Some of the data may not be in the Unit 4 system, but it's going to be the things that power the AI tools and other capabilities. Well, and this was interesting too, because I, I think it warrants a little bit of awareness that like, because they're, they're, they're Unit 4 because of their public sector business in particular, uh, they do have around, I think they said 12%, it was like 12 or 13% of companies that simply cannot move to the cloud for, for regulatory reasons right. in, the, in their country of origin. And so those, those customers receive an exception. But we had some interesting talks with Mike Etling, and he has talked about this publicly before in articles too, around conversations with customers around that, that, are, that are heavily customized um, and I, I asked him today, I said, what about these cloud benefits? Like have, it's kind of a cliche. So have you articulated what these benefits were? And he shared an anecdote of a customer where once he kind of got through talking the customer through what they can actually do in the cloud that they're now doing kind of manually stitched together and all that stuff, the customer totally this sees the business value proposition differently. And so I think this happens a lot, to be honest with you, with these quote unquote, over customized customers is that at first they get very defensive because they don't want to get pushed. But mm -hmm. once they can have a more relaxed conversation where they're more give and take about what their pain points are and what they want to go, they realize, crap, like this is just going to be so much easier for me if I can do it that way, you know? So, so there's, hey, you want to take the coffee away? No. Okay. Sorry. So there's a related issue to that. Um, they can't, uh, some of them aren't going to change, some of them that need to change, uh, part of the reason they don't is because they either don't know what the, the art of the possible could be in the future. So Etling's example was a good one uh, of explaining what is the art of the possible. But the other thing is, um, I think a lot of companies forget how much their organization and the external environment have changed since the time they originally implemented uh, the Unit 4 solutions. Right. They may have implemented an early Aggresso product line. And so uh, I find, I actually have a slide I use on public speaking things where I'm talking about big digital transformation projects. And I show here are reasons why some transformation projects fail or whatever, or get canceled. And I highlight six of them on there that happened to projects I was on. Not because I'm a bad leader of transformation projects, but like in one case, we had a great day at, at a client and, and on the remote site in California. And as we're heading back to the hotel, the CEO of this conglomerate personally calls me up to tell me that he just sold 40% of the company. Uh, they just finished signing the papers on it. So that kind of let's just say, train wreck the economics of the transformational project. So things happen. And I think a lot of stuff has happened in the time that people bought some of these products. And it's time to take yeah. a, a, a wide, eyes wide open kind of look at, you know, what should I be doing and what is possible? Speaking of things happen, uh, we already had our first inter podcast interruption with someone that wanted to break down the room. They wanted the coffee, Brian, but they can't have the coffee yet because we're not quite done yet. <laughs> One of the things that, I'll, that I look forward to when you're at an event like this is I know you're going to uh, raise your hand at some point. You're going to, you're kind of like a tea kettle, like it takes a little while and then you start boiling. So I knew it was coming and you had a, a couple doozy questions today. But one of them ties into something that I'm interested in, which is Unit 4's vertical strategy, because I felt like we could have benefited from more of, of a vertical approach to their AI plans. I would have liked to see the advanced AI functionality they have planned on their roadmap with the vertical by vertical breakdown. But one of the challenges you had to them was around their AI roadmap. Do you want to just talk a little bit more about what you're looking for from vendors when it comes to this? Because I know you're going to be updating your piece on this topic. So, so 
uh, I kind of triggered something that got some of the other analysts to talk. And I, they had a chart that showed by uh, horizontal function, like finance, HR, whatever, going down the page, if I remember it right. And then they showed what's going to happen in this year, 2025, and so forth, moving on down. They were given some examples of AI you know, capabilities they're going to release. And I told them that I thought the, um, some of that stuff from 2016 that they had there needs to get shoved all the way back up into what's left of 2024 even. And I heard another analyst or two kind of chirp up and saying they, they agreed with that. That uh, And I've seen, and I mentioned this to one of the Unit 4 people afterwards, that there are some vendors just in HR alone that have released like, you know, 70 different AI right. capabilities in their, that functional piece of their product. So the markets, I think the key lesson here is the market's definitely been moving uh, a lot in this way. What I don't agree with with a lot of vendors, they sprinkle this stuff in all over the place, but they haven't really, a, they haven't really made a connection between we added this uh, capability to this part of this product, and yet we haven't really shown you what the um, economics of it are, the sustainability impact of it is. Or we haven't even showed, you know, tell, explain which strategy a company might be embarking on and whether it works. For example, if I want to create a company that is a destination employer that people, you know, will stay not only years longer than they otherwise would have, I'm going to focus not on AI, but I'm going to be focused on things like how do we find who are the best leaders and how do we develop them and everything else, which is a very different set of problems than applying uh, AI to talent acquisition, for example. Right. And, and I, think, I think what I'm looking for from vendors, and I, I didn't hear enough of this from pretty much any vendor this fall, is not look for three things. I'm looking for I want to go under the hood of the architecture, which I've been able to do, but I have to press vendors on it. I want to understand which LLMs are you using, how your customer data is moving, are you, are you using smaller models, are you, what are you doing about log files, what are you doing about privacy, what are you doing about accuracy. Mm -hmm. I want to, so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about costs and pricing like mm -hmm. you just brought up, but I also want to hear about the vertical AI, but in the context of how you see that industry changing going forward, because that's the fundamental issue is that industries are changing for a lot of provocative and important reasons right now. And AI is one of them, but not the only one. So I want to hear about how industry is changing based on your expertise in that industry, and then how you're applying AI to help customers navigate that. And I think a roadmap that reflects that is interesting. I so. think that's a killer point. And I think vendors could take a big lesson from the big hugely successful professional services firms, they mostly yeah. go to market on uh, a vertical flow, not on horizontals. They right. gave that up decades ago. And why is that? Because many functions like general ledger and accounts payable, whatever, have been automated repeatedly uh, and consecutively to death. Many companies may be on like their fifth accounts payable system, for example. And you can you could find another half of a percent of efficiency gain by using AI to fix something in accounts payable, but that's not going to cut it. Uh, you know, right. what we ought to be focusing on are the things that are going to do make huge impacts in yep. some of the more vertical and operational aspects of the company. That's the frontier we really should be exploring. And and it shows, you know, and I feel for vendors that mostly have, let's say, a horizontal solution set, they're rolling out AI and all they, all they can talk about is productivity and efficiency savings. And I, and I would agree, we got to get the hook back on the vertical side. That's where the real savings and the real money is. Yeah. And I mean, you just look at an, a highly disrupted vertical like higher education, right, where tuition costs, student changes in student experience expectations, enrollment, diversity. In, in, in your enrollment, um, scholarships, managing um, uh, remote students, uh, meal plan navigation with custom meals and all that stuff that, that students today care about. Like AI can play a role in all of that, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I wanna hear about all that stuff, right? And so, so to me, that's, that's an area where unit four, I think can flesh out even more. And I'd like to hear more about 
partners in that area too, but I'll get to that in a sec. I, I did want to mention that we had a really good customer that came on. Uh, it was Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, and they came on virtually. And that's always a good good part of the analyst day when when the customer is there. And I thought this customer was unusually candid, especially for like a virtual thing, which can feel pretty awkward. I thought they were very pretty comfortable, and they were pretty open about like why they choose Unit Four, but also what some of the challenges are around. And they've came back to change a lot. But one thing I'll mention about the customer is that one of the main reasons they chose Unit Four was because of the multi currency capabilities, because mm-hmm. this is a substantial nonprofit with a lot of geographical presence across regions. And I wanted to mention that because that's one of Unifor's sort of self-proclaimed like sweet spots in the market is is these industries where there's more of a uh, some more like global multi-regional issues that companies are dealing with. So. Yeah, er- early in my career, if I had a uh, client who was doing the selection and they had operations more than a couple of countries, uh, the short list of ERP or accounting vendors right. they would really want to seriously look at got real short real quick. And I always, I always gave a, uh, if you will, almost an advantage and recommended my clients look at the vendors from Western Europe, maybe from Australia and a few other places, because they themselves are used to dealing in multiple currencies every day in their software business. And uh, it's one thing to say I could do multi-currency. It's another thing to, to really be a full-blown uh, multi-country, multilingual, multi-everything, and to handle everything, including uh, cross-country, intercompany transactions, the like. It's a different animal, and they definitely had that. Uh, and you look at the again back to the roots as a you know with a lot of uh, Scandinavian and Dutch kind of background. They were a Western Europe country uh, company, excuse me, with deep foundation in that. Any other thing that struck you from that customer interview? Well. On the customer side, um, I, I want to give a, a very positive uh, that there was a, a gentleman from Unit 4 who was kind of facilitating the Q&A going back and forth. And thank God he didn't do what we keep getting at so many other conferences and analyst events. They highly scripted. So tell me, uh, you know, why right. did you choose the industry leading, you know, blah, 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 you know, and what were the six power yeah. capabilities that we brought to and then the And then after every answer, that's fantastic. Oh, no, that's that, a that, good question. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. That's amazing, you know. Yeah, we didn't get any of that. I mean, uh, and, and I, I got to tell you, that, that made... That made my frustration level go almost to zero, uh, you know, which that's huge. Uh, I I can't, I don't like infomercials on late night TV. I won't watch them and I don't like them in an analyst event. Yeah, I've seen you uh, blow that gasket before and you didn't today. So that's a tip of the cap to unit four right there, though we lose a little bit of entertainment value when you don't blow a gasket. (laughs) So there there is that. What one thing that I thought was interesting around unit unit four's narrative is i i like what they're trying to do with with this whether it's self-driving erp or whatever i like their approach to flexible user experience and um and you know simplification and automation and all of that um but i wanted to hear more about taking advantage of it from a data and analytics and planning and strategy perspective because that's part of it too it's not just having a car that takes you where you want to go it's it's the more quote unquote intelligent version of ERP where you're being prevented with different roadmaps and different trip possibilities and, you know, mileage warnings and all the things and, you know, hey, I want to run this scenario and that scenario and I want to. And so I'd, I'd like to hear more from you for about that in the future, because I, I think what happens if you don't flesh that out is other analytics and planning vendors and AI vendors come knocking to your customers and say, oh, yeah, we'll take Unifor's data and we'll help you crunch this and that and we'll help you make better decisions, which is really what's at the heart of this. And so, but it was interesting to hear the customer talk about that because that was actually one of the benefits they're starting to derive from Unit 4, getting closer to a so-called single source of the truth where they can get a better window into their operations. So I actually think Unit 4 is delivering on that to some extent. They just need to talk about it more. Anyway. So this was a six-hour event, basically, and they couldn't possibly cover everything that we'd all nope. want to hear. And I want to make sure the listeners... It- understand that yeah yeah it's not uh, like a three-day event where you can really chase down your sections well, and stuff i don't want 
don't ask me to help on the podcast for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, way. yeah, um, exactly. But uh, your, your point about the uh, – for uh, I dropped my thought. Sorry about the that. The analytics part. Oh, the analytics, part, yeah. yeah. Uh, what I'd love to see the next uh, next event is uh, some demonstration where they bring in external databases to improve, uh, let's say, a forecasting predictive capability. It could yeah. be an, it could be an industry uh, database or whatever, yeah. or macroeconomic kind of information, and that I think will really help ma- bring analytical capabilities to the fore and will make that a much more compelling demo. And they announced their their digital assistant. Ava. Ava. And Brian, I almost called it a co-pilot. Thank God they're not calling it a co-pilot. I'm so sick of co-pilots, man. <laughs> so that's another point for Unit 4. Because uh, my whole thing with co-pilots is it's semantically incorrect because I looked this up online. A co-pilot has to be able to land the plane. Um, so I don't agree. I, I like the digital assistant terminology better. I think that's a better, a better description of today's AI and how it can help people. But anyway, I'm not going to win that one. I, I, I'm going to lose that battle. But anyway, so anything about Ava? Um, well, they had one previously, if you remember. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, we were talking about that. It used to be called Wanda. Right. And uh, uh, So Wanda this, got hit with the right sizing kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Wanda, Only room for one AI assistant. Uh, Wanda might have been ahead of its time. So in this right. case, Unit 4 was uh, was out there, out front. Voice leading. enabled, right? Hmm? They And it was voice enabled, too. Yeah. And it had some smarts behind it because it was trained up on some data. It, it couldn't do everything, uh, you know, uh, but, yeah. uh, but it was definitely interesting. Uh, but it kind of... It's been supplanted with a- by Ava mostly because, uh, well, part of it was they didn't get a lot of uptick on the product before. And like with many AI tools on the target market that uh, Unit 4 has, which is, they'll tell you straight up, it's mid-market companies. But that mid-market's a broad area, and it could go from a couple of hundred employees to 10,000 employees. And on the high end, they'll probably be big users of it. I don't know about on the lower end of the market unless uh, the stuff comes very pre-built, pre-canned, and pre-trained uh, so it can provide value that doesn't require a lot of personalization or customization for the customer. I did appreciate that the Unifor didn't overdo it on on the agentic AI front today. They, you know, they talked about AI in the context of what they were trying to do, but I thought it was it was it was a good mix like like some some analysts pointed out like like you said like beefier ai roadmap and more urgent ai roadmap i i get that but i like that it wasn't like another ai day we've had so many of those yeah i don't need any more of those in fact uh sadly a lot of the ai days that we've had to go through they're long on product roadmaps short on demos and even the demos aren't necessarily yeah. in production uh, I've yet to be in an event where they let the analysts actually sit down at a computer and drive, yeah. self-drive, if you will, interact you know, with AI the tools assistant, and find right, out yeah. what they can or can't do, Yeah, which it's, I think is a very telling thing. Yeah, it's felt more like an AI days, D-A-Z-E, <laughs> than, than days, D-A-Y-S. So, well, one of the things I thought we should touch on Mike Etling brought up their M&A strategy, and I thought that was kind of interesting um, because we heard he's clearly got an interest in tuck-in deals, which are, for the listeners, those are smaller deals where you pick up some nice piece of technology at a very decent price. You're not worried about picking up, say, thousands and thousands of customers, um, and you you know, that you got to find a, you know something to do with them and convert them or whatever. So anyway, he mentioned two kinds of M&A strategies they have. One is the tuck-in kind of deal, which your listeners probably know as the go out and buy a small new entrepreneurial kind of tech company that's got lots of cool technology, not a lot of customers. You, if you have to, even you can re, recode it to your technical architecture and then cross-sell the daylights out of it to your a larger install base. 
So that's not a surprise hearing that. What was a surprise was he mentioned that he's so bullish on the ERPX platform that he could conceivably buy another ERP company just to convert those customers off of an old on-premise platform to the ERPX platform. That I got to give them high marks for just having the guts to bring some, an idea like that to the table at an analyst meeting, because I haven't ever heard a vendor actually bring that up. I have heard vendors talk about doing a roll-up before, but nothing quite like this. So that was pretty... And it's a testimony to what management believes uh, is the power behind their ERPX platform. So that yeah. was what made that newsworthy. Cool. Well, let's get to our final sort of points as we wrap here. My final point is I think there's also a narrative around partners. There's a story to tell around bringing in some next generation partners and also just guiding current partners towards new business models. We discussed this some in the context that there are some partners, let's face it, their bread and butter is making money off customizing the hell out of ERP systems. And mm. it was pretty good business for a long time, Brian. But you know what? Every now and then something goes the way of the old dodo bird. And I think that a lot of that business is depleting. And there's a need for a different kind of model that allows customers to build out cool stuff they need using extension toolkits and things like that. And not falling behind on all the new stuff and not getting that legacy spaghetti all the time. So it'll be interesting to see how they bring partners along in that model. So I'll be looking for more of that next year. And those are all, those are my main points I wanted to hit today. Do you have anything else? Uh, two little teeny tiny things. Uh, we were here with the one and only Holger Mueller. And of course, when you have all three of us, that means the event isn't just all right. well attended or very well attended. Very well is with two. It was extremely, extremely well. well attended. Yeah. So shout out to Holger. And uh, along with that, I do want to make a mention that John and I are already working on the unpredictions oh, right. for 2025. And if anyone's got any... Um, any candidates for things they'd like us to consider or include in, uh, by all means, yeah. send it to us, uh, where we anxiously await any kind of feedback you guys want to send. Right. Indeed. Because we do, we're pretty good at picking out the quote unquote low hanging fruit, Brian, but sometimes <laughs> we need a boost of quantum <laughs> blockchain ready <laughs> insights from our listeners for yeah. this. <laughs> so, yeah. so please help us out on that front. And, you know, we'll do that as we do every year. And, um, I don't think trenchant's going to make the buzzword generator. Oh, possibly. I hope not. Uh, I, I, <laughs> hope not. <laughs> I think we've had just about enough trenchant insights, but I, I do want to share one thing though, which is that it's been a few years since we had one of these events with unit four. And I, the biggest change that I think about from the last one is I, I saw a much more confident and coherent presentation. The last time we were able to put them back on their heels a couple of times on a couple of topics around adoption, around customer success. Today, they kind of came out blazing on those topics and, and they, they were ready. And, and, and they were ready with a good story around the migrations, which we could have easily gone awry with some tough questions. And they, they had anticipated those and how they planned it all. So, you know, I see some progress here and I think they're one of these interesting vendors because we spent a lot of time in the ERP market focused on a handful of giants. But a lot of times I think the interesting stuff is happening in the small and mid market in ERP, especially with new approaches to industry. So I think they're going to be a fun company to watch. We shall see. I would agree. They were, this, this meeting was a different kind of unit four meeting than so many of them I've attended in the past, and it was a good meeting. It really was. So, uh, you know, John and I love to pick at things, and oh, we, yeah. we always can find things to uh, we'll pick at. We'll find some here. nits. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, uh, and then sometimes we get the compound uh, problem where one of us spots something, the other one just starts uh, yeah. realizes, oh, it's time to chum uh, the poor vendor here. But uh, but, you know, a big part of that for me, and the re there's two reasons why I do that. One is that when we see those issues get raised by yourself, a couple of the analysts did a good job with their pesky questions also. The reaction is priceless for me. Not even the answer, but just the look on people's faces when they see those questions and how they respond to them. 
tells me a lot about their culture and their confidence serving their customers. And I want to see that gut check. So that's the big thing. But the other thing is I want to come back in a year or two. And of course, we're going to ask some of the same questions. And I want to see what progress there is because no vendor has it all friggin' figured out. But when you see people saying, you know what? You guys raised a really important point last year, and here's what we did about it. Mm -hmm. That's what you want to see, and you want to see that from their customer um, feedback sessions as well. But when you put it all together, that's how you become successful, I think. So, I'm going to add to your comment there. You're you're right. They they were, uh, I, I don't want to say confident to the point of cocky, but they they you could tell they they have been working to this point for a while, and they have been talking to customers and prospects and partners about these same kind of messages. So they were ready for a lot of the usual kind of, let's call them objections, whatever that we might throw out. On the other hand, they were also so well versed of each other's capabilities. Did you notice how many times somebody would go like, great question. I know like, I know Johan's going to answer that. In the next, yeah, yeah the, in like, 15 you know, minutes or whatever. Section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there was a lot of that going on. Now, I know some of that's a time management deal, but it was also, it was really clear that these people, this wasn't the first time they've had to get together to talk uh, these kind of issues, either with prospects or analysts, what have you. So that was, that was really good. Yeah. I always worry about the vendor where... You know, this happens with me sometimes. I'll ask a question and the CEO jumps right up to go up back up in the front of the room to answer the question for some other. Right. Exam. And I don't like that so much because that feels like a bailout to me. And, you know, that's that's not what I want to see. I want to see people kind of in their own roles be able to finesse those things and say, yeah, here's what we're doing. And that's what we saw today. So good, good session. Yeah. Thanks for the debrief. This might be our last face-to-face -face in a little while, Brian. We're sort of finally on the end of our little fall uh, uh, tour, but we're going to have some month in review shows coming up. So we'll pick this up virtually. So if you guys want to catch our video show, it's coming up on one of these Fridays. So it should be fun. Ah, and I agree. I'm probably, I probably won't see you in person, what, till January, February, something yeah. like that? Yeah. Yep. Well... Uh, trust me, I'm not going to change between now and then. I oh, no, you are not. All right. Bye, everyone.